Hi, and welcome back to the Food Bod Pod YouTube channel. Here, we share some of the videos that we've shot as we've recorded for our podcast, the Food Bod Pod. So what you'll see here is um, some behind the scenes parts of recording episode three. So I hope you will have a listen to episode three in its entirety. Uh, you'll find it on all of your usual podcast platforms, um, on Podbean, Spotify, Amazon, Google. It's a slightly longer episode this time, but believe me, it's worth listening to. So in this episode, we are at the Matthews Cotswold Flower Mill. So the episode includes an interview with Bertie Matthews, uh, whose family has always owned the business. Um, it's a wonderful interview. He, I love him anyway, but he is just brilliant to listen to. And then we are also talking to Sophie Carey, who is the bakery development manager. Um, she has a brilliant job because she gets to do lots of test baking. So we are having um, a chat with her, but also Sophie is sharing a recipe with us. So in this upcoming video, you can watch Sophie and I actually making this recipe. You can find the written details on our website, foodbodpod.com. But we are shooting this in the middle of the mill. So there is some background noise, um, So for which I apologize, but it's a working mill, a working environment. Um, but you'll get to see the action as we were making the recipe. So this is not the um, podcast episode in its entirety. Uh, please do have a listen to that. Um, but this is the part of the podcast where we are making the recipe. And the recipe is jalapeno and cheddar pretzel bites. So they're very, very tasty. So I hope you enjoy watching. I hope you enjoy listening. And this now goes over to Sophie and I in the the mill bakery test kitchen. Have fun. Sophie, yes, tell me, what are we beginning with? What recipe are you making for us? Uh, we're starting with uh, the jalapeno and cheddar pretzel bites. Okay. They are just mini versions of the pretzels without the knots, so they're really, really easy to make uh, and they taste good. And is this um, a recipe you found somewhere, you've created? Uh, no, it was created, I mean, I'm sure other versions of it exist, but uh, it was actually created by me and a group of friends while I was at university. And it's developed and developed on from then, and I still make it now all the time. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> I know that um, cheese and jalapeno is so popular. I know a lot of my bakers, one of the first things they do when they get to grips of sourdough is then make a dough and throw in cheese and jalapeno. Yeah. Oh, it's delicious. A Such so, a good combo. What's the first part of this recipe then? Where are we Okay, uh, first step. So you want to get in a pan your milk, water, sugar and butter. And you just want to warm that up and then leave it while you weigh out everything else to cool down a little bit. Okay, so does this need to be completely liquid? Uh, yes, yeah. So the butter needs to melt totally. Okay. Um, and it, it wants to be just warmer than room temperature really. And that's so that we get the butter melted but also to get the yeast working. Okay, now for me, mm -hmm. being uh, that I'm a sourdough baker, yeah. and I don't use commercial yeast, this can be really interesting for me because whenever I, whenever I have tried to use it, yeah. I've never been that successful. Yeah. Um, so to actually, any tips that you've got with using commercial dry yeast successfully yeah. would be really useful. Yeah. I will clarify again for everybody listening, all of the details and quantities are gonna be in the recipe that Sophie's written up, it's gonna be on our website, so you can have a reference, and if you're watching us, you can see what she's doing. So we've got your melted yes, uh, stuff in the pan. Yeah, melted butter, milk, sugar, and the water for the recipe as well. Okay. Um, really, the yeast that we're using, because it's dried yeast, the first thing is absolutely make sure that it's in date. Right. Yeast out of date will not work, it won't rise, it will relax your dough, make it really sloppy, and that's all you'll end up with. So does it have like a reverse effect? Not that yeah. it just doesn't work at yeah. all, it will actually Almost. have a reverse yeah. effect? Yeah. Okay. Uh, in, you know, in professional baking, quite often there's a product called deactive yeast, which is old yeast that's used to relax dough. So if you need to roll a dough out, you know, 
for croissants or so, you know anything thin yeah you'll often add in a deactive yeast to basically relax it so that you can roll it out all the way um, so okay. it is important that it's in date uh, and then also you just think about yeast as a you know sim similarly in, in your sourdough it's a little pet that you have so you need to keep it warm you need to feed it and you need to give it time to grow so right. that's why we warm things up just so that it's not starting out cold and it will speed things up a little bit so go along the sugar, is the sugar a key factor in the flavour of the recipe or is that needed for the yeast? Both. Um, it's not needed for the yeast, but I like to add it for the yeast because it does okay. speed things up a little bit more. Okay. Um, the yeast feeds on the sugar, that's what creates the gas, so it's really great to have a little bit of extra sugar in there already. But also for pretzels in particular, um, it's actually quite a sweet dough. You have that salty topping, but it's quite a sweet dough, yeah. it's almost an enriched dough. So that bit of extra sugar is really great to keep it moist and chewy. Um, so it's it's for both, really. Okay, brilliant. So yeah. let me let you carry on. Keep okay. Interrupting yeah, you, so. no, that's fine. <laughs> so once we've got that going, um, what I'm going to do is I've weighed out my salt here. So that's uh, five grams of salt going in, and then I'm going to put in my bread flour. So uh, just so what we've got here is the mixing bowl that Sophie's going to use. She's put it on her scales with the salt in it, but we've zeroed it, ready to put the flour in. So, this is Sophie's doing the pretzel with the bag of flour. <laughs> Which flour are you using for this recipe? Um, so for this recipe, we're using our even load flour, but it's actually also the same flour that goes into our standard white, uh, strong white flour bags at the supermarket. So um, we call it even load for the trade, but if you buy the Matthews strong white flour in the supermarket, it's the same one. Is that the one in the black and white bag? Yes, in the white okay, bag. Okay, that's what I use in my starter. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so this is the flour that I would use in my starter. Yeah. So I could buy a great big bag of that. Yeah. And be doing the same thing. So that's even load. Yeah, even load. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I'm doing 300 grams of flour for this mix, quite a small mix really, um, but it's... Yeah, it's not too huge a dough, No, it? no, you can really scale this up as you like, but um, for me, this makes a nice amount. Of... They are very cute little scales. They're good, aren't they? <laughs> I was yeah. talking to David about them earlier. Um, okay, so now that we've got that in there... So we've got the flour and the salt in the mixing salt bowl. The mixing bowl. I'm going to, now that this is... Yeah, it's uh, cool enough, you know, now that you can touch it, it doesn't feel particularly warm, it's just above room temperature. So this is for the yeast to go into the for butter For the yeast mix. to go into there. So we'll put that in there. The yeast is now in the pan. The melted butter, water and sugar. And I'm just going to give it a little bit of a mix. I, th I think for me, when it comes to dried yeast, when you first pour it out or mix it with things, it never looks like a time. It's mass, not, it's it? because it's hydrophobic, um, the coating of it. What does that mean? So that when they've dried it, um, to stop any moisture getting in and uh, spoiling the yeast, they, they often dry it in a particular way or coat it with something mm -hmm. that makes it repel water. So when it first goes in, you have to dissolve that first to be able to actually dissolve the yeast into the, what you're making. Do you know how I'm <laughs> Are you, I can get more this David. I didn't know that at all. <laughs> Um, and once it's been mixed into there... So we've got basically a nice kind of murky brown yeah. puddle of water. That's pretty much it with some butter in there. So you've just used a bit of a whisk basically. Yeah, you can just kind of use a fork, anything like that. You want to just pour it all in. So the whole, the whole yeast thing mixture is now going in. in with the flour. Yeah, you want to make sure that the salt, you put that in first uh, so that it doesn't touch directly the yeast in the water because if it touches the yeast it might retard it, which is to stop it working efficiently um, and ruin some of its kind of potency. Okay. Uh, and I'm basically going to put this on to mix just to incorporate all of the ingredients for three to four minutes um, and it's at that point you can see whether it needs a little extra water. Um, if it looks a bit wet, it's fine, keep going with it because okay. we're going to bulk ferment it you'll lose some of that moisture as we do. So for people that don't know what that means, bulk fermenting means you're going to prove it. That's right, yeah. So just on a slow speed for, yeah, three to four minutes just to incorporate everything. Mm -hmm. 
Good. So now we're going to wait for that, are we? Great. Yeah, okay. Can you wait all over it? Can you hear as much anyway? I, I can, but uh, that'd be a nice little fade out and then we'll come back in. Yeah, okay. So let's stop it there. That's good. Lovely. I know it might sound like I'm asking you No, questions, please. Keep, keep going. It helps to direct what I want to say. I was just wondering whether I should be the other side of the glass so I'm out of shot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think you weren't in shot because we're so deep yeah. stood, but it's up to you. I just wonder whether it might be better if I'm okay. so it doesn't distract because all I'm doing is standing. If you've got any direction for us, we can see you. Yeah, yeah. that's true. It might be better, so I'll just get myself the other side of the glass. It also means I'm nearer the biscuits. Yes, I'm watching you. I'll be, I'll be telling Helen how many biscuits. And I can actually see what's going on as well, which makes yeah. makes my thing. What sort of yeast are we using? Just instant dry it's yeast. Just instant, yeah, easy baking. Oh right, yeah, okay, yeah. I don't often buy these tins. Yeah. Because like I said, the same with once you've opened it, once the air touches it, it's not. It doesn't work as well. It's yeah. only because I'm doing so much baking today and tomorrow yes. and Friday that I've gone for the tin. Have sachets, yeah. 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 yeah, I would. I normally do much prefer the sachets because you know, as long as they're within their best before, you know that they're still fresh. Whereas and if, this one, and if you don't use it all, you're not throwing away exactly. a whole. Exactly. This one, yeah. you just. I know it's got the cap and that's useful, but it's becomes a little bit more of a guessing game as to whether it's going to give you the results you want or not. I did a, a, a bread course some time ago, yeah. years ago, at um, Hobbs House Bakery. Oh, yeah, yeah, and, I know Hobbs House, yeah. yeah. Um, and they always recommend using Dove's, um, Dove's dry, yeah. instant dry yeast, which yeah. is apparently yeah. slightly better quality yeah, than Dove's. Yeah, I think it's, yeah. But but you can reseal that because yes. it's in a it's in a little big sachet. That's it. Yeah. So we're um, we're starting to supply to some flour to uh, to Hobbs, Hobbs House. Oh great, good. Um, which is really good, really excited about that. They're coming on board with the regenerative flour. Good. Because I've um, taken the right scanner to Shipton Mill. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we're going to pick this up again. Yeah. It's. Uh, it's all come together. I can see it doesn't need any more water. Okay, so I'll start recording now. Okay, so the dough's been whizzing around. So how does it yeah. look? Yeah, uh, so it looks pretty good. It's uh, it's not quite mottled. If I just grab a little piece out. It's quite sticky still, um, and there's not much gluten development yet. But you can feel it's nice and soft, um, and it's not too dry. So I think we're we're good to kind of ramp up the speed now and, and get it going for a bit longer. So the fact that it's sticking to your fingers, you're okay. With yeah, that? that's pretty good. It hasn't had any development yet, really. It's it's purely been to mix the ingredients. So once it's had a bit more development, it won't stick as much um to fingers or surfaces. And then similarly, once it has its first prove in the bowl that will help it to absorb a bit more of that moisture, tear it out and it won't be sticky at all. Okay, um, so you're gonna put it back in the mixer for how long? For probably six minutes or so. I would normally okay. do slightly longer, but then we're gonna add our inclusions. So we'll just take the time down a little bit. Okay, so you're gonna put it on for maybe about four minutes. Yep. And then you're gonna add, you're gonna turn yep. it off to add them? Or yes, you're gonna we're gonna turn it off okay. and add the inclusions and just mix them on a very slow speed. So right. you okay. don't want to bash them about too much, you just want to incorporate them in evenly. Okay. Okay. The good thing about this recipe, it's pretty cool fruit. It's, even if you do it totally wrong, you'll still end up with something that tastes good. Right, right. <laughs> okay. Okay, here we go. Surfaces and things like that. So you can actually stretch um, it out. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not particularly 
you know, glutenous this recipe. Um, it doesn't doesn't really require it uh, particularly. Yeah. But uh, it's it's got good enough development that will get a nice rise on it. That's all you're really looking for here. You're not looking to stretch it as far as you can. It, it just needs yeah. to be well developed. No problem. So what we're going to do next is we're going to add in our cheese and jalapenos. So um, I've got the cheese is diced into you know a centimetre square dices, okay. um, quite small, but you still want them chunky enough that you're gonna get nice pockets of melted cheese. And the jalapenos are just pickled jalapenos from a jar that I have drained, well dried, and chopped into quite a fine dice here. So I'm just, just reading uh, your recipe again. So how much, sorry, oh, how much of both have we got? Uh, 60 grams of both. 60 grams yeah, of both. 60 grams okay, of so both if these recipe. are the pickled jalapenos, have you um, drained them? Yes. Do you um, dry them as well, or you've just drained them? What I've them? done, because we had a bit of time today, I've left them in a sieve to sit okay. um, once I've cut them, and that's typically enough to, to dry them off. Okay, so but if you're right. using them straight away, just give them a, a pat with a paper towel or a tea towel okay. to dry them off. You just don't want them dripping in moisture. But you can see there's, yeah. that's what's come out of them. Since and you've then. used an orange cheddar. Yes, yeah. Give it some colour. Yeah, yeah. It's much nicer when it has that little pop of orange with okay. the grains. Um, so yeah, just gonna pop all of that in. These so are these add the chilies and the cheese. Yeah. Are both being added into the mixer with the dough. To just give them a nice even mix through. Yeah, so slow speed, just mixing them through so they incorporate. It'll take a minute or two. You don't want them to break up or anything like that. No, so you need to go as slow as really you can, but it will take time just to mix them in. Okay. It looks like it's not going to come together, but it will. So, out of interest, could you mix this by hand? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If anything, you know, sometimes that would be better because you'll be able to maintain the chunks easier. Um, it's easier, you know, for some still on a mixer, some not to have a mix. Totally take it to So what you get when you first start to mix it is the moisture releases. It looks horrible because it creates this little paste at the bottom. Yeah. But once that moisture gets reabsorbed, then that's when it picks up all of the inclusion. Mm. I should say as well, these are quite, um, the 60 grams to this recipe is, it does make for a real flavour punch. Yeah. If you prefer less, you can add less, yeah. uh, it's just personal preference. And scrape it off okay. so that it's all in the bottom of the bowl that way it's not just moving it around it's actually mixing it in okay oh so you use the dough scraper just to really bring it together yeah then, kind of just sure. to put it put it all together at the bottom that way it will start to mix it in a bit easier recipe before with dried jalapenos as well you can get those um, on Amazon or I found them before in um, Spanish supermarkets they're really really great for it as well so they don't add any moisture but if you are using them you need to compensate so you need to add 
extra water to your dough to compensate for not using fresh jalapenos or pickled jalapenos. So. But the dry would often be a stronger flavour as well. Definitely, yeah. So yeah. If you were going to use 60 grams of the wet ones, would you use, say, 30 grams of yeah, the dry and 30 grams like of that. water or something, something like that? Something like that, yeah. Okay. yeah. It's a little bit trial and error if you're going to swap ingredients out, but it is worth doing to find something you really like. Ooh, this So what I'm going to do is just tip it out onto the bench. Okay, so the bowl space is just to get the dough from the bowl onto the bench. Yeah, that's right. And we've got an orange and green studded dough. <laughs> it smells lovely. A little sprig of flour. And then I'm just going to finish it by hand just to make sure it's really evenly dispersed. So you're just using basically a typical kneading action. Yeah. Just to make sure everything is moved through it. That's right. The stove isn't high hydration enough. There's not enough water in it really to um, slap it about particularly. Um, it, it won't do you any, any justice with it. So just use a classic folding method on this one. Okay, so I'm pretty happy with that. It's a nice smooth dough. It's a nice see. little round ball of dough. <laughs> studded with cheese and cheese. That's it. So, and then I'm going to put it back in. Not that bowl. I'm going to pop it in a bowl. Do you grease the bowl or anything? Uh, I don't. Um, no, if you have a bench scraper, you don't need to because you'll be able to remove yeah. it. If you don't have a bench scraper, you can give it a kind of brush with some oil. Um, that won't do it any harm, but you know, it's a bit of a waste really. So if you're just pointing this at some cameras so people can see, <laughs> this is this is what our dough looks like. Snug in this little bowl. There it begins. <laughs> um, and then I'm just gonna cover it and uh, leave it out on the counter for about an hour until it's grown at least double in size, um, if not more. See, this, this is what I just forget about using commercial yeast, is how quickly the dough grows. Because to me, now, if that it's was like sourdough, <laughs> yeah, you'd be sitting it on the counter for the next 10 hours. But because this is with commercial yeast, it's going to be a whole lot faster. Yes, it is. Um, okay, so, so that's, that's the first done step done. First step done, yes. Brilliant. We're now, going to, yeah. we're now going on to pretzels. Pretzel bites, okay. Yes. We are recording video and audio. So we're back with the dough, yep. which is nicely grown. Yes, it's, it doesn't grow too much, this one, mainly because of the level of inclusion that we have. But equally, the beauty of this recipe for pretzels, you don't actually need it to grow that much. Pretzels, by nature, are quite dense, soft, chewy, with that yeah. kind of crust on the outside. So I'd still is, say it's kind of doubled. Yeah, I would say it's, it's doubled, yeah, yeah, for sure. So just tip it out onto the counter. Um, and this is where we're going to form the actual shape of them so we're not going to kind of roll and tie them into pretzel shapes we're just going to cut them into bite-sized pieces um, which makes it ideal for you know entertaining or anything like that so you're going to chop them into pieces yes. and then roll them into balls uh, I'm, I actually tend to just leave them I'll show you a way to chop them um, that kind of leaves them nice so you don't need to do that um, so I've got so my dough. We've got the dough on the counter with a bit of flour so just it's not sticking. Not flattened it, but I've just pressed it so it's kind of even in thickness. So it's probably about long. an inch, inch and a half deep. Something like that, yeah. And then uh, all I'm going to do is take my bench scraper and first cut one way. Um, you want them to, to be, realistically, you're cutting about an inch um, apart every time you cut. So you're cutting an inch long. Inch wide, sorry. Um, so you had your dough fingers. into a bit of an oval, and yep. now what you're doing is just chopping it into mm -hmm. pieces. Yeah. So you're going lengthways across it, and they're about an inch wide. Yeah. So we're just creating some lengths of dough. Yes. And again, it really doesn't matter if they're different sizes, or you know, like here, you've got little bits coming off from where they've not been cut at the same angle every time. It, 
they're very rustic um, and it just basically you're just getting them down into bite-sized pieces trying to keep them as even as you can just so that they all cook at the same time but that's it really that's the other point of that this looks like it would be a really easy thing to make for if you've got people coming over yeah. or you need a quick a quick thing for visitors or yeah. even something you can make with children I this would be say. great with children there's a little bit where you'd need help with the boiling and baking but children would be fantastic yes yeah. so now that i've got the all cut into lengths um, i'm just gonna go across and cut them into little nuggets so what we had was a whole set of sausages of dough and now you're chopping them into little pieces yeah so the doughs were about an inch wide as you chopped it and these are not much wider that you're actually cutting them into. So we've got a nice little collection of pieces. Again, it doesn't really matter if some are bigger, smaller than the rest. You'll, you know, they'll still be delicious. You'll still enjoy them. Um, you don't want them to be too different because it, it could mean that some bake quicker than others. But if you get some that bake quicker, they're quite nice because they're the crispy ones. <laughs> so I can hear something that's going on over on your hob. Yes. So what have we got in the saucepan? So what I've got on at the moment is just a, a saucepan about half full of just water at the start. Um, what gives pretzels their chewy exterior is uh, it's typically a, a mixture of lye, but actually on lime, sorry. But actually when you make them at home, you can do the same thing with bicarbonate soda. So you want to boil your water, you want to add in a good amount, a couple of tablespoons of bicarbonate of soda, and then every pretzel bite, you're gonna boil it just for 30 seconds or so, and that helps to give it that really nice chewy crust when it comes out of the oven. See, I find this fascinating, because I think, who on earth discovered that? <laughs> to do funny, that with it? the dough. But yeah, that's what gives them that sheen yeah. and that little chew. And the nice dark color as well, and it also helps the salt to stick to them. I do like to salt these after I you know, boil them so that they've uh, they got that nice top. Oh, okay. Is this what the sea salt That's what the sea salt are flakes are going to be for, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so that's... You're free to not salt these because they have got the cheese in. They sometimes don't really need it. But yeah. if, you know, if you left all the, the inclusions out and just made salted ones, they're delicious as well. And that boiling just helps to give the salt something to stick to because these are floured currently and wouldn't stick to them. So we've got quite a lot yeah. of pieces here. And not a very big sauce. We've not got a massive sauce So you're so going to do them? I'm going to do batches of them. Okay, but if you have a bigger sauce pan at home, yeah, you can just put I, a whole lot in them. Well, I still wouldn't recommend putting the whole lot in because you'll need a way to get them out. And the only way to get all of them out at a kind of vaguely similar time if you put them all in would be to drain them yeah. into a colander. But in doing so, you risk squashing them down. Um, they're not cooked when they come out. It's just the exterior that's got that kind of rubbery right. crust. So if you were to tip them all out, the weight of it on the on the bottom ones would crush them. Um, mm. So even if you had a big saucepan, bigger than the one I've got here, I would recommend just doing a few at a time so that you don't get overwhelmed when you try and pull them all out. And you're going to use a slotted spoon or something? Yeah, I will be. Yeah, I've got to just have a quick look in the drawer and see what we have here, but I will be using something like that. Or you can just use a couple of tablespoons. Yeah, just go fishing. So they're going to go in to the boiling water, which is going to have some bicarbonate soda That's in. That's right. And then you're going to lift them out and they go straight on a tray? Straight on a tray. Drain them? Nope, they go straight on a tray. Any okay. of the, this is one thing, it's really important when you make this recipe to line your tray with baking paper um, because any of that excess water bakes off really quickly in the oven, but because of the bicarbonate soda in it, it can leave a residue behind. So oh, you don't, ruin your tray. it could ruin your tray. So just be okay. careful and just line it well with some um, baking paper before you start, but there's no need to drain them, you know, get okay. every bit of moisture off them because it evaporates as soon as it goes into the oven. Okay. okay. So if you're going to add bicarbonate of soda to that water, it's going to buzz. It's it is, gonna it's going to fizz up. So just be careful when you add it in a little bit at a time. You do want it to be quite potent, but if it's getting too hot, just move it off the hob. If it's going to like it's going to bubble over, move it off the hob. Um, ideally, you'd have a bigger pan than this, yeah. but we work on with what we have today. <laughs> And we uh, will reiterate, we have details of this in the recipe on the podcast website so you can read it. <coughs> but you can hear the bicarb doing its thing. So we, we've got some really nice active bubbling water going on. I'm just going to turn it up to make sure we achieve uh, something between a simmer and a boil. Okay.
the layer and um, bicarbonate soda, is that the same as baking soda? Yeah, so I'm just going to move this a bit so you can see what you do. So one other thing for this recipe, um, try and stay organised and make sure that you have everything to hand. So I've got my hot plate with my boiling water here, I've got my tray just next to me which is already lined with baking paper, I've got my dough there and then I've got my flaky sea salt here which is what I'm going to use to top it. Um, are you with the sea salt? Have you put them in the salt? Or are you just going to sprinkle no, the salt I'll just over sprinkle the top? it over the top. If you were to roll it in, you might end up with too much on there. So okay. um, just a, just a, a, a little sprinkle on the top. So I think for this size pan, I'm going to do about five of them at a time. You just want to plop them in. Uh, and a good way to tell when they're done, they should definitely all float. So if there are any that are stuck to the bottom, just give them a little jiggle okay. or use a spoon just to release them. But you want to go for about 20 to 30 seconds. It's not a huge amount of time, but again, with this recipe, it doesn't matter if you go too much. So we're not looking for a colour change, we're not just looking for them to float. That's it. And and they've expanded. They have, yeah. yeah. You can see... Oh my gosh, they've she's covered. that much bigger. And you've got uh, a nice rubbery skin going on the top. Uh, it doesn't matter if on the tray they touch, nothing like that, it'll be anyway um, and as they steam off you start to see really they'll go a bit more wrinkly um, but this is the perfect time just to kind of a little sprinkle of salt on each one and then the rest of them will will join them yeah so it, it, I think this is only time consuming because you've got a small Absolutely. pan haven't you if you've got a big but pan, if you've got a bigger pan really quick. and once you get yeah. to grips with it put more in at a time you know as yeah. you get more confident add a few more to the pan it's not going to do any harm if they're sat in there for you know a minute over 30 seconds okay um but it's it's purely at the start you don't want to overwhelm yourself um if you're then struggling to take them out oh god they've been into you yeah. you just want to take it slow until you're confident with what you're doing so it's okay if they can put it together on the baking tray yeah. because they don't expand too much as they grow as no, they bake they don't um, because okay. the, the dough that we're using is enriched with butter, milk, all of that stuff, it, it does prohibit the yeast slightly, but what you're looking for actually is quite a dense mixture. Um, so you don't really need them to be puffed up too much anyway. They're doing it though. They, they are. are getting they puffy. are getting puffy. Yeah. You see my water just started to boil over a little bit. So, so I've just it taken it off and moved it over to the other side. It doesn't matter if the bicarb gets foamy because, like I said, that water goes away in the oven and it does add to the texture and the flavour. Um, the only thing with this particular recipe is you just want to watch out that your cheese isn't melting away. Because <laughs> if you've got any that are poking out, then it will start to do that, but it's not too much of an issue, just bring them out. I'm going to stop there yeah. and then we'll pick it up when they're yeah, all done. Definitely. Yeah. Should I stop the video as well? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. These need quite a high temperature, they want to be around 200 degrees, uh, maybe even up to 210. Um, they're quite short bakes, so between 15 and 20 minutes. Please, um, you really want that hot temperature to get a nice golden crust. Um, you don't want to dry them out on the inside, you can bake them any lower and slower so they're not going to dry. And is it something that you would be more or would you be always going to pull? Uh, either or, I eat quite often half resistant if they come out of the oven to have a few straight away, but they're really good cooked as well, so um, they can be totally personal preference, you just want to give them five minutes to so them out, otherwise they get quite hot and hurt So there we go, we have them all on a tray, ready to go in the oven. Now, time for the pretzel bites to come out. Oh, there we go, my timer's going off. Look at that, perfect timing. Yeah, excellent. So they've got a really nice, dark, golden... So this is the pretzel bites coming out of the oven. Oh, wow. Nice, dark, dark Look at those. Which is the bite part, really helps to give it that. So this is... You know that colour you get with pretzels, that golden brown colour? 
that's come, I guess, from the dipping, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. so that's yeah. what we've got on the top. And uh, you do get a bit of leafage from the cheese, but it all turns yeah, into nice crispy bits when you take the them off. That's the bits that you can take off um, and try, isn't it? So yeah, you do want to leave them, because of the cheese, you want to leave them to cool for a few minutes before you dig in. Um, but yeah, the, you know, really nice kind of shine as they cool, really nice dark golden colour that you would associate with pretzels, and they smell really good too. Yeah, so just touching it, a couple of, it's a little bit soft, I yeah, think, that they firm up. They then, do, yeah, they? the crust, as it cools, it, it thickens up and it, it firms them up quite the a lot. They never go crispy. Have, like a crack on the crumb. Yeah, there. it's almost like a tiger bread. That comes from this not being a very, uh, it's a very short process for this mm -hmm. dough. Um, so, you know, if you were making a loaf like that, you would almost say that would be an imperfection of the loaf is where well, you've got that split or that crackle because it didn't have enough time to really process properly right. but that's what you want for this dough because yeah. it's so dense and chewy you kind of want it to be um, shorter development time now we're, what we're having to do here is keep our producer on the other side of the glass otherwise <laughs> he's going to be in burning his mouth on these so this is at the you point must where, wait. Yes, that, that, that dangerous point with baking where you need to let things to cool, otherwise, <laughs> otherwise you will burn your mouth, so please do let them cool. Yeah.